morning. Welcome to Daily Devotion. I'm Pastor Krieger. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Last Friday was Epiphany, uh, where we uh, recognize that Jesus has been revealed as the light of the nations, uh, the Savior of the entire world, not just one chosen nation. Or rather, we, we could also say that, uh, that he will save only his chosen people, but that his desire is that all people will be adopted into his family, um, that all nations would be his chosen people, uh, that we're all children of Abraham by believing in the promise, and that through baptism, he makes us one body in Christ. So the tradition of the, of the church uh, has then been to mark the Sundays after Epiphany uh, <clears throat> and to recognize all the ways that Jesus is revealed. Uh, the first Sunday after Epiphany was uh, this past Sunday, uh, two days ago, and on, on that day, uh, we recognize that Jesus is revealed as the Christ, the anointed one. And that anointing took place at Jesus' baptism. And one of the historical readings for that Sunday is from Isaiah chapter 42. We didn't read it in church, so I'll share it with you here. Uh, this is uh, the first of the four servant songs in the book of Isaiah that refer to God's suffering servant. Uh, when we read it, um, even if for some reason you could read this and not realize that it's talking about Jesus, um, the Gospel of Matthew makes it very, very clear, makes it explicit in Matthew chapter 12, where it says specifically that Jesus uh, is the fulfillment of this prophecy. We're going to read just verses 1 through 7. Um, as I read it, uh, see if you can just think about, about all the ways that this prophecy is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Isaiah 42, starting at verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. This is the word of the Lord. This is describing what Jesus' work is going to be. He will be God's own servant, sent to accomplish God's mission. God chooses him, God upholds him, God delights in him, God puts his spirit on him that he would bring justice to the nations. And that's exactly what happened in Matthew 3. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven and rested on him as a dove. And the Spirit remained with him his entire ministry. So what can we say about that ministry from Isaiah 42? We can say it's characterized by gentleness. It says that he won't, uh, he won't snuff out the smoldering wick or, or break the bruised reed. Uh, but for all his gentleness, nothing will keep him from his goal. And what's that goal? Justice. That word uh, justice appears three times in, in the portion that we read. Um, in verse 1, he will bring justice to the nations. Verse 3, in faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. Verse 4, he will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on the earth. The Hebrew word that we translate as justice is mishpat. It's one of those words that just sort of defies translation. It's, it's more than justice. It's more than judgment. We're not talking about a savior who 
can be reduced to some divine lawyer. Uh, mishpat involves uh, it involves customs and involves divine laws and authority and and a lot more than that. Um, trying to equate it with some English word is has been described as as sort of like trying to compress an essay into just a few letters. He doesn't bring justice just in the sense of of declaring some to be innocent and some to be guilty. He he brings about God's justice by speaking God's word into the world and bringing about God's peace. God's peace, which, which means that everything is restored to the way it's supposed to be, uh, including our relationship with him. And he does this not in some kind of pushy way. <clears throat> I mentioned in the psalm, uh, or I mentioned that this, this section was quoted in Matthew chapter 12, showing that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. Now, specifically, it's connected with um, Jesus healing people who were sick and warning others not to tell people about him. Because he wasn't in it for the personal fame. He was in it to accomplish the mission the Father gave him, and he wouldn't let anything stand in the way of accomplishing that mission. And so while maybe it's it's hard to come up with an uh, an English equivalent to mishpat, we can get a better sense of it by by seeing exactly what Jesus' mission was and seeing what he was doing to carry it out. He was healing, he was teaching, he was, he was casting out demons. His mishpat, his judgment, his justice, it's, it's the restoration and the salvation of sinners. That's the mission. And there's really so much about uh, this that it completely defies reason that God would make his own son to be this servant. And that his own son would then suffer as a result of accepting this, this mission. And that God would do all of this for creatures that thought they were too good for him, too good to obey his laws, too, too good to follow his, his commands and his lead. But this servant would not falter in carrying out the mission. This servant will not be discouraged in any way until the mission is accomplished. And have you ever considered just how Hopeless we would be if this mission depended in any way on us. If it depended on us not getting discouraged. And I know how little it takes for me personally to get discouraged. And I don't mean that in a way that, that I, I'm suggesting that I'm somehow more fragile than any, anyone else, right? Um, that I'm, I'm the exception to the rule. I don't think so. This is just the way sinful people are. Um, and we can even for the moment forget about the big things that can cause us to be discouraged, the big things that, that can careen us down a path of, um, of, of veering away from, from accomplishing the goals that we've even set for ourselves. When people we die, uh, people we love die unexpectedly, or even for that matter, when they die after a, a long and slowly progressing disease, um, or when we pour everything that we've got, personally and financially, whatever, into something that we want really badly and it fails. It doesn't even take that much, though, does it? Um, sometimes it's a sarcastic comment that hits a little too close to home. Or a sideways glance that makes us doubt the way we thought people uh, thought of us. Doubt their love, doubt their, their respect. Or how about if someone else receives an honor that I am certain I deserve more than them? Um, we falter. We're discouraged. But in all the ways that we fail, this chosen servant succeeds. Jesus' baptism marks the beginning of his accomplishing that mission, uh, that mission that God gave him, his ministry on earth, a ministry that leads him all the way to the cross where he suffered for our failures, for our shortcomings, our lack of faith, our lack of trust. That's what he came to free us from. Verse 7 says that God would make him to open the eyes of the blind, to free captives from prison, to release from dungeon those who sit in darkness. And that's where we would be if not for Jesus. But with Jesus as our substitute, our substitute in life and, uh, and death, um, and and now being connected to him through our baptisms, we have died to sin because he died on the cross. And because he died on the cross and he rose again, we're connected then to that resurrection. And we now share in his life 
through faith. And these words of God for his servant are now for us. God says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. That is our confidence and that is our hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.